we're talking about the subjects in the curriculums, but I want this to apply to all of our life, how we look at all of our life. And so we talked about the subjects, all of them in school, we said they come from God, they come from the heart of God, they come from Jesus Christ, what is their purpose? And we've said, well, their purpose is to reveal God's glory, what God loves, what uh, God's wisdom, reveal His heart to us. And so the next question that we are going to just look at related to question number seven, why are we teaching them? But again, I want this to apply in a broader situation. I don't want this just to be for teachers. I want it to be for teachers, students, but for all of us to understand our how we look at the whole creation. And so, why did the Hebrew study and learn? And I have some Bible passages here. And uh, I don't know, uh, Joe, would you like to read this one? Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. And so, is that a clue to you why the Hebrew would study and learn? What's the goal? Praise. Praise. That is one goal of education. That's one goal of why we're studying, why we're teaching why we are thinking. It's to give him praise. That's from Psalm 150, verse 2. Here is another one from Job 42, 5 and 6. And so, Vera, would you like to read this one, Verla? Uh, my ears have heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is what Job says at the end of all of those questions that God gives him. Can you explain the weather? Can you explain where snow is found? Can you explain how mountain goats can climb on the rocky crags? Do you know where hail is stored? And, oh, there's just question after question from weather, from biology, and at the end, Job doesn't answer any questions. All he says is, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. God opens Job's eyes to see in the creation, this is God's work. This is God's glory. This is God's wisdom before us. And so that's related to praising him. And, and Job says, I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. I have never seen you in creation. And creation reveals God, reveals His power. And that's how we think biblically about all things. We go on here. The school curriculum, these are the subjects that we've talked about. We ask what are these subjects? Where do they come from? Question six. What is their purpose? Question seven. This evening, what do they mean? When you see the creation, what does that mean to you? What do you understand? And so that's question eight, and there is a misprint in your booklet. Therefore, we've taken a dollar off of each of your... Uh, the price <laughs> and it should say what do these subjects mean rather than why do these subjects mean and I that's my fault so what do they mean and here is what I believe they mean they mean that God created scientifically remind you, science is not an enemy of the Bible, is not an enemy of the church. Science reveals God's wisdom, God's covenants, God's power, 
God's beauty, God's pleasure, God's glory. We are not opposed to science. We're opposed to historical science, which we've studied earlier, which is based on assumptions, which is not based on science. Science and the scripture have the very same author. They are not in conflict. We embrace science, true science. So God created scientifically. And so we, we discover the laws of science. Jorge, aren't you reading about Isaac Newton? Did you tell me that this morning? Yeah. Uh, Isaac Newton, a great Christian, right? And he's the one who discovers the law of gravity. Is it true that an apple fall on his head or is that just a story? They wrote a true story, but that's where they chose. Yeah. So many of the early scientists that we have uh, were Christians, and they discovered these things. And so we're not opposed to science. God did not create magically. He did not create unpredictably which, uh, and experimentally, which means God didn't say, well, let's try this out and see if it works. We do a lot of that kind of stuff, right? We'll see if this works. Maybe this will work. Maybe it'll not work. God has all knowledge. God has all wisdom. He has all power. And so this statement, I think, is very significant because as we study biology, as we study earth science, science, and we study physics, and we study chemistry, we're always confronted with God's covenant. God's covenant with, with oxygen, with water, you need how many molecules of hydrogen to have a molecule of water? You all know that's two, right? H2O. That's God's covenant. God didn't put that together to see what would happen. He knew it. And he creates all things scientifically. And so that's the God who cares for us. That's the God who loves us. His initial act of creation was wisdom. And I'm going to give you a verse for that, and Abby, you're going to be our reader for that. No, Josie, you two girls, I have to look at you carefully. You're looking so similar. Are you sisters? <laughs> Josie, would you read Proverbs 8, 22 to 23? The Lord possessed me wisdom at the beginning of his work, first of his acts of old. Ages, ages ago I was set up, and first before the beginning of the earth. That's just beautiful. Before he begins creating, God possessed wisdom. And that wisdom is expressed throughout the whole creation. You know how wise you are, or we know how wise somebody else is, by their work. What happens when they do something? And so the Lord possessed wisdom at the beginning of his work. And God is the all-wise person. Thank you, Josie, for reading that. God embedded. Embedded means it's in there. He didn't add wisdom to the creation. Wisdom directed the creation. Every aspect of his creation reveals his wisdom. And so when you and I study anything, 
investigate anything. We are investigating, exploring, probing into the wisdom of God. And he said to Adam and to Eve, subdue the earth. Subdue means put it under your authority, develop it, use it, create things with it. And so all the inventions that we have today are really the result of men and women uncovering, finding the wisdom of God. Look at all the medical science we know today. We didn't invent it. We discovered it. We discovered the wisdom of God. Uh, you've all flown on an airplane the last 20 years, right? And they've got these little fins that go up at the end of the wings. You know where that idea came from? From the, the big raptors, their raptors that their their the feathers at the end of their wing go up, and through study we find that stabilizes that bird's flight. And today we have all of that. They uh, when the Japanese made the first bullet train, uh, they had a big problem with it because it was going so fast and when it went through a tunnel there'd be a huge uh, sonic boom. You know what they studied? They studied the kingfisher bird and studied how its beak and how its head is so designed that that bird can fly, fly very rapidly. And so the Japanese used that scale to build the front of their bullet train and the problem with the sonic boom is gone. I find that just amazing. We study God's wisdom and we employ it in the creation. So his wisdom is embedded we don't add God's wisdom to creation. We uncover it. We find it. And, you know, if you love gardening, you're in agriculture, you're into computers, whatever you're doing, all of that, understand, is the wisdom of God embedded in electricity, in chemistry, in DNA. God, as God commanded each aspect of creation to appear before him. Understand, God said, let there be. He calls light into being. Light appears before God. Every aspect of creation appears before God. As he's commanding it, he established his covenants with them. Light. How fast does light travel? Thank you, Joe. Why does it travel at that speed? God's law, God's covenant. That's how fast light travels. You have your different colors of light. Why do you and I see reds and blues and greens and yellows and purples? What's God's wisdom? It's this the wavelength of light. And that wavelength of light is energy coming to us and we see all these different colors. Those covenants don't change. It's God's glory. It's God's wisdom. And so there's land, there's seas, 
the plant world, the sun, moon, and stars, fish, birds, animals, man, all reflect, reveal, proclaim God's glory. And so study science and understand this is what God gives us. Every one of them remains in existence. That means everything God created only because Christ is upholding his covenantal relationship with them. Colossians chapter 1, 16, 17. All things hold together in Christ. We don't have to wonder whether today water's going to boil at 212 degrees. Because Christ is maintaining we don't have to wonder whether when we play basketball this ball is going to bounce up and down. These laws are there. The only way, the only reason we can do science is because Christ is upholding his covenant. That's how it works. Any comment you want to make? Crystal. What was that reference? Colossians? One. Colossians 1, uh, 16 and 17. I'm sorry, I do not have it on this slide. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, I just think Colossians 1, 16 and 17 really is powerfully foundational to thinking biblically. And here is a photo that was sent to me by one of you taken by one of you and added this wonderful verse. In fact, there you probably can't see it. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. I, I, I'm really happy to receive these. You send me anything you want. I will share it. Ben? Where did you take this photo? In our backyard. In your backyard? What did you use to take it? And this is a picture of what? And what is a nebula? This is just absolutely spectacular. And Benjamin tells me, you know, we're reading through Psalm 19, looking at verses which uh, talk about God's glory in the creation. And you took this picture some time ago, or just well, ten years ago. Yeah. So isn't that beautiful? Uh, it's just like Job. You know, Job said, I think every science lesson, it'd be wonderful if the children would say, I had heard of you, but now my eyes see you. And Benjamin, you are showing us the glory of God, the beauty of God. All so wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And you all love starlings, right? I think it's because we kill so many of them. But you see what this is. Once in a while you will see it. You'll see it in the fall of the year. These starlings are synchronizing. You just write a note down in your booklet and go to, you Google this, and Google starling synchronizing. And you'll go to, you'll get YouTubes. And you're going to see one of the most spectacular ones is in Israel. These starlings, who we don't like, we think, they fly in tremendously 
beautiful formations, none of them crash into each other, and they move, and they go up, and they go down, and you say, I wish we could see that every day. That is so beautiful. God's wisdom in these starlings, they are able to sense what the starling beside them is going to do, they never crash into each other. And I understand we're using some of that technology with these self-driving vehicles that they're going to, my car senses you're getting a little close to me, and so the cars talk to each other, and it's following this synchronizing of the star. How many of you have watched one of these YouTubes already? What do you think of it, Jim? It's wonderful. I also watched, uh, actually have experienced the same phenomena in the silver sides, the small fish that swim in thousands of them in the ocean, and they do exactly the same thing. I really appreciate you saying that, because the fish also synchronize. Just masses of them. And you can say, well, what do they do that for? Anybody got an idea? I think it's fun. Right? <laughs> God has pleasure and the creation rejoices and birds just love having fun. I don't I think all of you probably don't like, you know, squirrels. Are they okay with you? Are, are you nasty squirrels? Well, I've got one squirrel just plays around in the grass, does somersaults, runs, does a somersault, and I just think, wow, you're really having fun. Who's enjoying God. The squirrel, and if you have a sense of humor and sense of delight, you think, look at that. The whole creation reveals God's glory, God's beauty. Here's another one. We don't live by the ocean, but when you go there and you see dolphins, they can flip their little tails and shoot way up out of the water. Why do they do that? It's fun being, an, uh, being a, a dolphin. <laughs> what does God say? Fill the ocean. He tells to the birds, fill the sky. And they praise and glorify God by their joy in being dolphins in this case. That's the meaning that we see in all of these things. There are goats that climb trees. How can they get up there? They're way up there. It's another thing, just Google goats climbing trees and you can get YouTubes of those and you're just going to chuckle. And I've not seen one fall out of a tree. You maybe are going to find it. But they, there they are. And God asked Job, you know, how do the mountain goats climb on the rocky crags? Well, Job wasn't anywhere near uh, the goats climbing trees. But the very same thing. How can they do this? What? intelligence they have. They've got God's wisdom. And God just shows you this and says, look, this is what I make. This is what I love. This is what I enjoy. And the whole creation expresses it. Let's see. Uh, I have to have two verses here. Abby, did you read yet? Your turn. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
wonderful heart of words. My soul loves it very much. That is such a wonderful passage to think about because I know when you give birth to a child, just like David did, this verse just comes out. And if you're pregnant, God is knitting together your child. Now why does he use the word knitting? Well, your body has many different systems. You've got a digestive system. You've got a circulatory system. You've got a respiratory system. You have a nervous system. You have an immune system. You have a skeletal system. Can God just make the respiratory system? And now he says, okay, got that made. Now I'm going to make the uh, digestive system. Is that going to work? All of these systems are being created and knitted together. All at the same time. And God forms that baby in the womb. And we all say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God's wisdom, he it, he's scientifically <laughs> creating you because that means knowledge, that means wisdom. And so just a little review, you have a skeletal system and bones provide a framework for the body, act as a means of protection, provide storage for minerals and generate new blood cells. Whose idea was that? That's God. How can you teach the skeletal system without giving glory to God? The human body has 206 distinct bones. Babies begin with at least 270 bones, but as they mature through the age of 20, some bones fuse together. We're born, our, our skull is very, very flexible. Once we're born, those bones harden. I just find that just amazing. Digestive system, look at that. We make from one to three pints of saliva a day. Where do you make that at? You got saliva glands. Wow. Why are you able to do that? God's wisdom. The liver is the largest organ in the body and performs more than 500 functions. I am fearfully, I am wonderfully made. Circulatory system, and it goes through the lungs. And the lungs and the, and the circulatory, the respiratory system are tied together. All the blood vessels of the human body have a total length of 6,200 miles. They could encircle the earth 2.5 times. Because you have to have blood going to every cell in your body. God's wisdom. We had to be knitted together. Adults have about 300 million alveoli with a total surface of about 75 square meters. Your lungs, you keep you know, going deeper and deeper, this is where the oxygen is transferred to your bloodstream, carbon dioxide is removed. And if you're a smoker, you're polluting that stuff. But I don't think any of you smoke, do you, anymore? Well, 75 square meters is about the size of a average house. All created, 
all permeable that air can pass through. So I just find that very, very wonderful. Christian education, and I want to say Christian thinking, uh, you know, I built this uh, program really for training teachers and seminarians. Christian education examines and reveals these covenants of God through which we begin to see and understand the measureless wisdom of God. And so I really love you homeschoolers and I really love you Christian school teachers and I, you parents that support Christian education. But I think the question always has to be how are you and I revealing the covenants God places in creation that's in science that's in social studies how we work together that is in English there's there are covenants for that there is those things that are exposed to us and so one reason I love to teach science because you're just dealing hands-on with what God has created experiment with it, you can cut it open and enjoy. But we cannot look at Christian education, but we have a Bible class every day, and we sing hymns every day, and we pray to God at the beginning and before lunch, and we pray at the end of the day. That doesn't make a Christian school, you understand that? It's what we're teaching. Somebody, you know, argued, and I, I think he's right, that a Christian school should be a Christian school even if it did not teach Bible. Even if it did not have a chapel. Because all that is learned is glorifying God, revealing God's power. Would you agree with that? I'm not saying to take Bible out of the school. I'm not saying, I'm saying that should not be the marker that defines Christian education. Say, well, now we had our Christian part here. Now let's open up our math books. Let's open up our history books. And we're gonna teach it from a secular perspective. This is a Christian perspective. This is a long one to read. Lily, are, would you read this for us? Jacob awoke from his sleep and he felt, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is not other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. How well is the gate here? I am the one who is in the Thank you, Lily. Jacob awoke and he says, God is in this place. The Lord is in this place. I was not aware of it. That's with the ladder, all right? And by the way, Jacob did not climb the ladder, okay? I cannot sing that song, We're Climbing Jacob's Ladder. He never got on it. It's the angels coming down and going up. But I use that verse because I think that's how it is in our life. Look, God is here in my garden, in my car, in my office, everywhere. This is God's wisdom. This is God's power. I am not aware of it. And so the purpose of this course is to really brighten your day, give you much more joy in your daily living because God is here. You still have your peacocks, for Yeah. Yeah. God's beauty and your horses, right? And all of you have the creation at your hand. In him we live, uh, live and move and have our beings. And so one of the markers is that we must understand God is the main character in history 
in science, in math, in uh, English, and I'm also going to say to this, in Bible. You can teach the story of David and Goliath and never refer to God. And you can make David the great champion. It's very, very possible. Then, then we, we're not glorifying God. That's, that's idolatry. Thank you, Lily, for reading this for us. Uh, let's see. I think it's your turn, Tim. Dan. Do you see what that means? When you and I grasp the greatness of God in the creation, we're going to say, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Because all things reveal His covenant, reveal His power. So, what do these things mean? We stand in awe of Him for what He has done and continues to do. I'm going to teach you a lesson on kangaroos that's a couple weeks away, but I hope that you just say, oh, oh, this is wonderful. So, I think we who are teaching the events you know, teaching, preaching. God must be presented in such a way that people stand in awe of Him. This is what God has done for me. This is what God does. And so we see this awesome God, and remember, He's the God who's for you. He's not against you. He's the God who chose you before the creation of the world. He, he, he is the God of glory. All subjects are theological. What does theological mean? Theo means God. Logical means study. Every subject you study, and then I'm going to take that away from the classroom and I say, everything you're dealing with, whether you're farming, gardening, a mechanic, working at, in a factory, everything you work with is basically theological. You have, I, we have never done anything secular. Secular means it is separated from God. Give me one thing that's separated from God in the creation. Nothing. Paul says whether you eat or whether you drink, you do it all to the glory of God. There's nothing that is not theological. Do you see God's wisdom, God's glory, God's power. Do you thank Him and say, wow God, this is so enjoyable, this is so awesome, this is so beautiful. Thank you so much. He is glorifying Himself in and through all the subjects, all the things we see. Not just in Bible. Not just in saving your and my soul. The whole creation is filled with the glory of God. And He's presenting that to us all the time. Now the daylilies are blooming, right, Sue? Really beautiful. And you say, wow, here's another daylily proclaiming the glory of God. Dandelions do that too, right? <laughs> they do. They do. Our studying 
matter what you're doing, probes. Probe means digs into, looks into. Probes, ponders, praises, and proclaims more and more of his glory. And so Luke, you're going to be what? A fourth grader? You're going to probe deeper than a third grader, right? And you're going to ponder. Ponder means think about. You're going to think about in a deeper way than a third grader. And you're going to praise God. You're going to say, God, wow. You're so wise, you're so powerful, and you're going to tell everybody about it. You proclaim it. Jenny, are you in the... No, you're going into fifth grade, aren't you? Wow, you're getting old. <laughs> but as we get old, we probe and ponder and praise. Let's see. Nikki, it is your turn. With God so close to the the field of today's life, the bar was thrown into the oven. We did not much more clothe you than we do with Just look at that. The grass of the field, they would mow it, they would let it dry, bundle it in a knot, and that's the fuel for their fire, for cooking, for baking. And Jesus says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, these beautiful flowers, but its only purpose is to be mowed down, dry, and thrown into the oven. It's going to only live for a day. You who know day lilies, why do they call them day lilies? They only there for one day. They're so beautiful. You better take a picture today because tomorrow it's finished. And God puts all that beauty into a one-day lily. And you say, well, if God does that, you know what that means? He really has created me for His glory, for His use. Thank you, Nikki. Our lives are safe and secure in Him forever. God doesn't change. He has your and my life all written unchangeably in His book. And he knows our end from our beginning and everything that is happening in your life has happened or will happen is not God wondering what's going to happen. He has it all made, planned, put together. That's what that means. Here's a question from the Heidelberg Catechism. What do you understand by the providence of God? And I'm going to have... Uh, Jim, have you read yet? Would you read the answer? Because I think when we read, we don't think. All right? So you're the one that's not going to be thinking. The rest of us are going to be thinking. All right. God upholds heaven and earth and all creatures. And so rules them that rain and drought, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, even all things come to us, not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. Thank you, Jim. The creation. You can go back to the Colossians 1 passage. That's Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 10. All right. And how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? Jetty, I'm going to have you read this because there's some big words in here. Are you ready? The indication of what things 
go against us, thankful when things go well, and and for the future we have good confidence in our faithful God and Father, that nothing will separate us from His love. All creation is 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 so completely in His hands that without His will nothing can nor will happen. Thank you, Jay. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? You see his covenants with everything he has made. And since I see that he upholds those, he is upholding everything for me. Nothing happens by chance. It all happens by his will. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, Marcel, Psalm 48, 1. Great is the Lord, and great is your praise in the city of our God. We've read that before, but do you see how that makes sense? Well, I think we've had this before. God is, all subjects are theological. God is wise and powerful. He loves and delights in his creation. That's something that I think I didn't realize until later in life, and that's something I just really want to emphasize. He is faithful, constantly keeping his covenants with his creatures. He cares for the creation, and he restores it, and Jesus says, I am making all things new. He loves the praises of all of his creatures. That's the meaning of this creation. Look how God is upholding, blessing, caring. Are there any comments you want to add to that? I know some of you are writing this down and I'm not going to steal it away from you. Because this really directs my thinking and your thinking. Do you mind if we go just a little bit longer? I got permission, all right? Official. <laughs> but for you that, you know, love Christian education or love to think biblically, this, I think, is so helpful. What are these subjects? What are these subjects we're working with and teaching? They are the work of God. I've added this one. Uh, they're work of God created by the word of God to reveal his glory and righteousness. I think you know that. This is just kind of a summary. There's nothing that we touch, nothing that we make, there's nothing that we use, there's nothing that we work with that is not the work of God. It is all His. And His Word commands it. His Word creates it and He does it for His glory. His righteousness. They publicly display His perfect wisdom. The whole world sees God's glory. You look at the same flowers, you look at the same sunsets, you look at the same rainbows, one person will see God's wisdom and God's authority and God's power and beauty and pleasure. Another person says, it doesn't mean anything to me. Because one of them is filled with the Spirit of God. Now we drive down the highway pretty soon. You see the corn, see the beans. Wow. Did you see the sky last night? When, when I drove home from a wedding reception, it was just beautiful. That was like around 7 o'clock, maybe 7.30. It was just so, so beautiful. And you just say, God, that is beautiful. That's wonderful. 
therefore God is the main character. You know that already. And His glory must be the focus of our activities and lessons. Your thinking, your speaking about things, make sure that God is the main character. Don't walk away from it. Abram Kuyper, who was the Prime Minister of Holland around 1900, he had daily devotionals on the radio, and they have been collected, and the book is called Near Unto God. Anybody have that book? I have a copy of it. It's, it's uh, you can download it, by the way, free from the internet, called Near Unto God, and it's by Abram Kuyper, and uh, it's just a comforting read. Lots of little devotionals. But he says in the one uh, where he has, uh, the title is Loving God with All Your Mind. How do you love God with your mind? Okay, you know, we can love God with our heart. <laughs> but how do you love with your mind? He says, any science which denies God ignores God or places doubt in the hearts of the students about God is no longer science but it's idolatry would you agree with that yeah we cannot separate science from its author I highly recommend that book to you you can download it for free. Our unit and lesson concepts, this will mean little to some of you. Uh, in Peoria Christian, last year, we've been training our teachers that your concept is the revelation of God. God must be written in your concept. Teacher, student objectives, all right? Uh, Mr. Cope does a very wonderful job of that. He teaches 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th grade math. And he, in, in his objectives is the students will be able to explain God's covenant for addition, God's covenants with triangles, all related to God. Our strategies, our testing, if, if we teach the children to glorify God in their evaluations, you know those as tests, they better express glory to God in their answers. If they can explain how, how rain, how clouds form, and they have it all correct scientifically, but they never talk about how God's covenant does that, do they get a straight A in a Christian school? No. Because they have not reached the objective. They have not reached the goal. So they must focus on Him. That's not as our goal. So that's the end. And has this been a helpful lesson to you? Interesting? inspiring, stimulating. Our lesson next week is going to be comparing the Hebrew model of education to the Greek model of education. And um, I think it'll be very, very interesting. Most of us were brought up in the Greek model of education, whether you went to a Christian school or a public school, you probably experience Greek education, and I want to show you the Hebrew model next week. Thank you again, John and Sue, for serving us, and thank you all of you for being here. I'm inspired by you, and I think next week we will have the Croids back and the Van Forts back, and I know some more will be coming. So. Anyway, let's pray. Our Father, you are glorified by your work. 
we thank you that you call us to see you. And when we probe into the creation and we ponder whose beauty, whose power, whose wisdom, where does this all come from? May our minds, our hearts express praise and glory to you. And so tonight has been a wonderful evening. We've enjoyed delicious food, which you provide, and we enjoy fellowship, and we enjoy this time together. May you be praised. In Jesus' name, amen.